Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Nazia Hussein, and I work for the Open Society Institute uh, with the At Home in Europe project based um, in the UK. Um, thank you all very much for being here today, and I'd like to give a big thank you also to the Woodrow Wilson Center for giving us this opportunity um, to the OSI to, to be here. Um, I'm going to be your uh, moderator for the next hour or so, and how we're going to um, progress with this particular panel is that I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, hopefully very briefly, you've all seen the bios outside, and then I will ask them to give us a presentation of their main points um, for about five to seven minutes, and then I'm going to open it up to um, questions to, to the audience. And I'd like to begin with uh, Mr. Um, Luc Veron, who is serving as the uh, Minister Councillor and Head of the Political and Development Section for the European Commission in uh, Washington. Um, from the CV, I can see that you've done quite a lot of, um, or had quite a lot of different roles. Um, but prior to joining to uh, the European Commission in 89, he was an economist at the French Central Bank and served as a naval officer for France, where he was awarded the Medaille de Bronze. Um, we're going to begin with the um, European Union um, points of view in terms of integration. Um, the focus for this panel being what is actually going on in Europe with uh, the situation of Muslims. And as I read the, the, the opening um, section of the um, agenda that's in front of you, I can't but be um, hit by the fact that it all seems to be quite problematic um, in many ways. So I'd like to ask Mr. Veron to actually let us know what is going on um, in regards to their policies um, in the European Union when they look at social inclusion, look at integration issues, and how do they work with the um, changing face of Europe, with the growth in terms of the member states within the European Union, and the very practical, real changes on the city level that are taking place um, across the uh, various different member states of the EU. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Mr. Veron to uh, please begin. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Nazia. Um, I'll, I'll try to address very briefly then, because we have little time, uh, and I'm happy to come back in the, in the discussion. Um, some key questions that I, I hope will meet the, the mandate I received from, from the organizers. Um, I will seek to cover very briefly the EU approach to um, an achievement in integration policy, and I use this, this word integration um, as a shorthand for both assimilation and integration, and not in terms of European integration theory, of course. Um, and I would like to include the following uh, remarks. Number one, uh, integration issues must first and foremost be tackled at local level. Second, however, integration policies require an EU approach as well, since specific uh, policy choices on the part of one member state may have implication on others. Third, it is important to, for the EU to help promote the economic and social cohesion throughout its territory. And finally, while integration has been primarily the responsibility of the member states of the European Union, the European Union itself has been active in developing common approaches on integration and promoting the exchange of best practices amongst its member states. To begin with, the, uh, the, at the beginning, uh, it is clear that, in, that immigration, migration from third countries into the EU uh, poses a, a range of Democratic, demographic, political, social, economic challenges. Uh, Muslim communities in particular face a variety of common, well-known problems from social exclusions, high rates of unemployment, disenfranchisement, lack of belonging, and racial discrimination. I should also point out, I was made clear by Rashid Hussain in his introduction, that integration of uh, Muslims and other populations is a challenge known to both the US and the EU. Uh, the excellent um, 
Transatlantic Trains Immigration Survey um, produced by the German Marshall Fund and others uh, make this particularly clear. The most recent uh, 2009 survey finds, for example, that respondents in both the US and the EU support permanent over temporary labor programs. Though support for legalization of illegal immigrants is up in Europe and down in the US. Respondents in both the US and the EU also agrees that both employment and fitting in the whole society are important elements of successful integration policies. That said, uh, migration policy across the EU cannot be some interference with currently. Um, migration policies across the EU cannot and is not one size fits all. Uh, challenges vary in nature and intensity from city to city and country to country. And though I'm frequently reminded that, um, of the dangers of making EU and US um, direct comparisons for, the, uh, for fear of applying the dreaded uh, federalism word, to the European context, it is clear that there are many similarities between the, the EU and the US in the immigration debates. States are asymmetrically exposed to migration flows and have very different demographic makeups, making it difficult to design a single policy. It's true in the US, it's true in the EU. While integration policies remain first and foremost a member state competence, the EU has made significant contributions has made significant contributions to um, this field and has helped devise integration strategies that reflects the complexity of migration flows in Europe. Indeed, successful integration of third country nationals has been identified as a priority and a key component of a comprehensive EU immigration policy. Against this backdrop, what has the EU achieved so far? I would like to mention three policy milestones um, that are helpfully named after three uh, European cities. Temporary in 1999, The Hague in 2004, and Stockholm in 2009. The Temporary Council, European Council, in 1999, called for a common integration po in immigration policy which should grant third country nationals rights and obligations comparable to those of the citizens of the EU. And this can be seen as the basis for future integration efforts. In 2004, the program adopted in The Hague, Netherlands, underlined the need for greater coordination of national integration policies and EU initiatives and developed 11 common basic principles which became the cornerstone of EU policy integration. And I could come back to this during the discussion. What will the EU do next? And that's probably most interesting. The Stockholm program adopted last December. This program reflects the growing need to contemplate the multidimensional nature of integration, as a, not as a single policy area, but requiring coordinated strategy, a coordinated strategy across a wide range of fields. It also aims to create a new coordination mechanism that will, be better, that will better monitor the result of integration policies, increase the comparability of national experiences, and reinforce the European learning process. The Stockholm program further emphasizes the need to improve consultation and involvement in civil society. Several other recent developments in EU integration policy are also worth mentioning. I would like to mention the Lisbon Treaty, not for its entire 
um, um, impact on, on integration, but because in this particular area, it offers a new legal basis for integration. It foresees EU action to promote integration and, and places the European Parliament and the Council as co-legislators in this field in promoting the integration of third country nationals residing legally on the EU territory, excluding any harmonization of laws and regulations of the member states. And to translate this in, into non-EU wonk uh, language, this means that integration policy now has a firm EU legal basis, building on the intergovernmental approach represented in temporary, the Hague, and Stockholm programs I've already, I've already uh, alluded to. Another important instrument that I would like to mention is the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, whose mission is to ensure that fundamental rights of people living in the EU are protected, and I could come back to this in more details. Let me conclude, given the time um, allocated by the moderator, by briefly summarizing key principles that form the basis of EU integration policy. Integration is a dynamic two-way process of mutual accommodation requiring not only effort by national, regional, and local authorities, but also a greater commitment by host community and immigrants. The multidimensional nature of integration is increasingly important, and as a result, mainstreaming integration into all relevant policy areas, for example, employment, education, social inclusion is key. Integration cannot be tackled in, a, in an isolated fashion. I recently uh, stated by Commissioner Cecilia Malmström, European Commissioner Cecilia Malmström, while we face continuous demographic changes in our societies and rising unemployment, the notion that third country nationals are no longer needed in the EU is wrong. With an aging society, there is an increasing need for labor and hence the contribution of migrants become vital, becomes vital. As emphasized in the AIG program, integration is a key component of a comprehensive and successful European immigration policy and must be approached in this context. As European countries try to successfully integrate their growing ethnically and culturally diverse populations, the mutual reinforcement of local, national, and Europe-wide approaches to promote social cohesion and integration in a, is a necessary process. Local, national, and Europe-wide approaches complement one another. The European Union added value in this debate is to reflect on the different histories, traditions, practices, and institutional arrangements of its member states and bring the national experience to the European sphere. In that sense, the European Union might be viewed as consisting of a number of laboratories of democracy with the goal of finding and to the extent possible disseminating best practices among our member states. And this is a concept, I believe, that is not uncommon in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask um, Tufal Chowdhury to um, now talk to us about what's actually happening on the local level. We've just been given a, a, an overview on the European uh, perspective in terms of integration policies, but when we talk about um, integration, when we talk about um, our everyday experiences, they're not on the national level, or let's say on the EU. It's about living where you are. It's about where you live. It's about your neighborhood. So I'd like to ask Tufal Chowdhury to talk to us a bit more about what is a picture that's painted um, in terms of the work that you've undertaken looking at the experiences of uh, Muslim communities on the city. And Tufal is a um, lecturer in um, law at um, Durham University um, in the UK. He's also the senior policy advisor for the um, At Home in Europe project of the um, OSI and has been engaged and involved with work looking at Muslim communities with the OSI since 2002 and also been um, engaged um, um, 
with a variety of different institutions and organizations, um, including um, becoming a research associate at the University of Oxford Center on migration policy and society. So um, please tell us a little bit about what's actually happening on the, on the local level. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, Nazi. I also wanted to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center um, School for Scholars for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and it's, it's a real pleasure to speak, even though it means missing the first half of the England game. Um, I think it's worth doing this. Um, I am, I've, uh, and, it's, and Nazi is right that we've been um, working on a project looking at how integration is taking place at the local level across 11 different European cities. It's a three-year study looking very much at the experiences, direct experiences of Muslim communities and uh, Muslims and non-Muslims living in the same neighborhoods across 11 different cities. And I think that gives us a very rich picture of the interactions and the experiences that take place. And it's a very um, important level at which to look at some of these issues because in some ways the, the national picture, um, particularly from across the Atlantic, may look very um, difficult and challenging in terms of integration. You have stories about the um, attempts to ban various types of clothing or to ban minarets. And in some ways, the national story reflects the fact that national identity is often part of an imagined community, and so many of the actions are symbolic, whereas at the local level, what you really need are practical actions and practical delivery. And so when we started looking at integration at the local level of what happens with in the areas of education, in employment, in housing, and policing, and um, even around identity and belonging, the first thing we found which is really interesting was that there's a very positive story to be told around integration, that actually integration was working relatively well at the local level, working well in the sense that integration in it, in it is a process that involves conflict, that involves disagreement, that involves people having to negotiate new ways of doing things. And that and that, that's a natural part of the integration process. I think for many European countries which are looking at themselves as cities of migration for the first time, or countries of migration, that may, that may have come as a surprise. And part of the panic at the national level, perhaps, is a reflection of not recognizing that integration is a process of, uh, in, which involves some degree of conflict and managing that conflict, ensuring that people, um, the, the process is one that's respectful is the key thing. And I guess here in the US, you have much more of a longer history and experience of doing that and know that it's not that somebody who arrives um, shouldn't be expected to be integrated within 10 minutes of arrival and not to panic too much if that doesn't happen. Um, so th I think that the first thing that we'd say is that the at the local level, there's some very positive stories, some very positive indicators of integration. And so in, in our survey, we surveyed over 2,200 um, individuals, local residents living in um, the same the same neighborhoods, both Muslims and non-Muslims. And we found that on the whole host of indicators of integration, even on things like sense of belonging of whether people in the same neighborhoods of different backgrounds got on well together, we found that overwhelmingly both Muslims and non-Muslims thought that actually things were working well in their neighborhoods. That doesn't mean that there aren't um, challenges that exist. And so perhaps in the, um, what I'd like to do now is just to identify what are the key areas where challenges do exist. Um, the first is um, around discrimination. And so one of the interesting things in our findings was that we asked people to um, give their own direct experience of discrimination, whether they had experienced both racial, religious, and ethnic discrimination, um, and also the extent to which they felt that there was discrimination taking place in their society, the levels of racial discrimination and religious discrimination. The interesting thing here was that on the issue of racial discrimination, there's general agreement amongst Muslim and non-Muslim respondents about the levels of ethnic and racial discrimination that took place. They kind of recognized what it was and how much of it took place. On religious discrimination, on the other hand, the, the response is very polarized. Uh, most of the non-Muslim respondents didn't think there was very much religious discrimination. Most of the Muslim respondents thought there was a lot of religious discrimination. I think that reflects the fact that actually the same type of treatment is interpreted differently by the different communities. So something that would be seen as equal treatment or fair treatment by non-Muslims was actually seen as unequal or unfair treatment by Muslims. And it comes to the core of some of the issues around the lack of any consensus or an agreement um, around what religious equality looks like in Europe and what kinds of accommodations are necessary or appropriate. And that's the discussion I think that Europe, European cities and communities need to have. Um, on uh, another area of challenge, I guess, is around political participation and citizenship. So in some, in many of the cities, the ability of local 
Muslim communities or individuals from Muslim background to participate depends upon the local laws around access to citizenship and voting rights for non-citizens. In some cities, it's very good. So Antwerp provides um, very good, um, quite sort of straightforward laws in terms of being allowed to participate locally in voting. Um, and so you've got very strong, and not only do they have liberal laws when it comes to allowing people to vote, but you have to vote. So that kind of creates a different dimension. Uh, by contrast, um, Germany and France are two countries where access to citizenship is more is difficult and also you can't vote if you're not a citizen and so it, it leads to questions of democratic accountability and legitimacy for local policy makers and so those become quite crucial issues as to how do people participate when they don't have citizenship or they don't have the right to vote in local um, decision making processes and then we also identified that in some of the areas such as education um, the disadvantage that it was experienced by Muslim communities is much more to do with the fact that some of the structures around education hadn't taken into account the needs of diverse multi-ethnic migrant communities and so some of the research in ac across Europe is suggesting that it's the educational structures that lead to selection at a very early stage at um, 11 years old where people go into different types of schools um, whether it's vocational um, skills or ac academic education and those those education education systems had been structured or created at a time when the countries weren't as diverse, didn't have large migrant communities, and so the impact on, um, on migrants hadn't been taken into consideration, and so it was now recognized that these education systems needed to change and needed to adapt and adjust, and so in Berlin, for example, the Kreuzberg, the city, the part of the Berlin that, we're, that our report was looking at, the local education authorities are beginning to adapt and adjust the education system to, rec to sort of ensure that there, it doesn't disadvantage um, people from migrant backgrounds um, as a result of the way that selection takes place. And then, um, just just going back to sorry, just going back to discrimination. The other point is that um, the, the group that was most likely to report experiencing religious discrimination in our survey was European-born Muslim women. So, and in particular in the area of employment, and that did um, focus around issues of um, the headscarf and particularly women who wore the headscarf faced discrimination. In some of the cities, um, the notion, the ideas of the neutrality of the state when it came to religion meant that you couldn't work in public administration um, areas because if you wore the headscarf. So Antwerp was one example where the city um, decided that any Muslim woman who wore a headscarf wasn't able to work in a frontline service that involved interaction with the member of the public because this would violate the neutrality of the state. So again, discussions around what neutrality of the state looks like and what it means um, needed to need to be opened up. On the other hand, something that was very positive um, is healthcare. So I know that healthcare is an issue that um, has been discussed in the U.S. It was something that both Muslim and non-Muslim were incredibly positive about. They were very satisfied with the healthcare services and with the responsiveness to healthcare providers to the needs of different religious and cultural communities. So I think what the what, what overall what the picture shows is that you know, discrimination, political participation remain issues, but actually at the local level things are happening, service providers are responding to the needs of local communities and to the diversity that exists, and existing structures and ways of doing things are being adapted and adjusted, and that process is a natural part of the integration process and that uh, very much practical actions are taking place. And what, the, what our reports do is highlight some of the good practices, some of the things that are working well that other cities can learn from. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, I'm going to move on to our third and our final speaker, who is um, Hisham Helia, who is a fellow at the University of Warwick Center for Research in Ethnic Relations. And he's also the director of the Visionary Consultants Group, uh, which is a Muslim World West Relations Research Consultancy. Uh, previously um, at the Brookings Institution, he has been an advisor to different branches of the UK and the US governments. And um, he has actually recently um, published a book called The European Other Muslims of um, Europe, um, published by Edinburgh University Press. Um, having heard the previous two speakers and um, coming um, to you now, I want to put to you um, the two of the key issues that sprung out of the other two um, discussions. One being that integration is a two-way process. And from what I'm getting from um, Tufal's work in terms of the um, role of faith 
um, in terms of forging identity and how that actually works and is practically implemented on the local level. What can you tell us in regards to what Muslim communities are actually doing um, in order to um, actually be part of this two-way process? And um, what are the sort of activities um, that are being undertaken across Europe by various different Muslim communities? Thank you very much, Nazia, and thank you very much to the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me here today. Um, I don't see Andre in the audience anymore. I wish she were here because she's really been a star over the past week, um, sorry, over the past months, trying to arrange this and uh, manage all of our travel schedules and all of, and there she is right now. We were just thanking you, Andre, for all of the marvelous work that you've been doing. Um, and uh, unlike to fail, I'm actually very happy that this takes place during <laughs> The football game because I don't I wish to be spared the pain of of watching yet another England match. Um, now, uh, the 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 two speakers, but also um, I think Rashad Hussein, the uh, the special envoy this morning, brought up a very interesting word which uh, Basam TB also picked up on in his question: securitization. And it's something that myself and other colleagues within Europe, um, and I'm sure within the United States as well, have also looked at quite intensively because it really throws a new dynamic into how we discuss identity for Muslim communities in Europe in the 21st century. Now, if, if you look at the historical sort of progression of how we discuss identities for uh, European Muslim communities over the past 20 or 30 years, we begin by looking primarily at ethnic identities, national identities, you know, uh, Pakistanis, Indians, Bangladeshis, North Africans, Turks, and so on and so forth. Um, that begins to change slowly, especially towards the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century, where you have a strong section of these communities beginning to emphasize more their religious identity. So religion becomes a faith, not just internally, but also an identity marker. And that's something very different, I think, um, for those communities, but also for Europe. Uh, and this is something that I don't know is properly understood outside of the European context, because in, in Europe we're, we're very post-religious, we really are, and having uh, a huge community of people, um, you know, we're talking of tens of millions of people in the European Union now, who look at religion as being one of their primary identity markers, this is quite unsettling to a continent like ours. It's not necessarily wrong or right. That's not the issue. It's just very unsettling. You know, we, we, we haven't had that sort of experience for quite a long time. And this is one of the things that Muslim communities in Europe have had to come to grips with, that now that they are consciously identifying themselves, first and foremost, as uh, Muslims or pertaining to a religious community as opposed to an ethnic minority and so on, they, it really does mark them out. For those, uh, for those members of the Muslim community, that are from a migrant background. And it's very important when we talk about outside of the European Union, but within Europe, because obviously Europe is larger than the European Union, um, we do have a large number of Europeans who are as European as anybody else um, and have been Europeans for generations and generations, but are Muslims. They may come from Southern Europe, um, where we're talking about, you know, Turkish minorities that exist within, you know, Bulgaria and Greece and Thracia and so on. But we can also talk about Northern Europe and Central Europe, uh, the Tatars in Lithuania and Poland, um, as well as converts and their descendants that exist all across Europe. But having said all that, it really does, uh, it, it really does set, you know, the bird among the pigeons, doesn't it? That you have a continent that is so post-religious and you have this big community that's talking about religion in such an open way and a very natural way. Something that probably wouldn't cause as much attention in the United States, for example, but definitely causes a lot of attention for us within Europe. Now, past 2005 in particular, not so much after 9-11, but past 2005 in particular, with the Madrid bombings in Spain, with the London bombings in the United Kingdom, you have these identities really being affected by the security debate, which brings us back to this idea about securitization. And it's not altogether a positive sort of development because now everything is through this prism of security, always, um, to the point where um, you know, different countries have experimented with different national programs. Within the UK, we, ha we had, or we still have, although it's 
much smaller than it used to be, the prevent sort of framework for discussing these sorts of issues. Suddenly, everything to do with Muslim communities it has to come through the prism of security, housing, health, um, education. It it's all comes under that sort of prism. And you can't really do very much within that prism. It's a very constrained kind of prism. And it, it actually hurts the security aspect of it as well. I did a lot of work with the security establishment after the 7th of July bombings and conflating these t two types of issues, social cohesion and community engagement and so on on the one hand and security on the other and violent extremism. They, they work quite well when they're separate. They work terribly when they're co-joined together at the hip. And that obviously did have quite an effect on how Muslim communities conceived of themselves. Because prior to this particular point in 2000, well, I mean, it started in 2005, but you can really see it get going in 2006 and 2007, and it's uh, developing since. Before that point, you can definitely see from the late 90s, um, for about sort of 10 years, these communities experimenting very creatively with different modes of cultural expression and coming up with new ways for them to be Muslim in the 21st century, but also of being Europeans, Brits, Germans, French, and so on, but different ways. And this is something very interesting to look at because it didn't come from government. It didn't come from any external sort of force. It really came from the communities themselves. And you can see this very vividly when you look at the discourse of these different communities, the speakers that uh, are you know all over the place and doing constant uh, discussions and speeches and so on. Th they're constantly talking about the need to indigenize these communities, make them really a part of the national fabric of these different communities. And it varies. You know, Europe is a big continent and we have lots of different stories. Germany is in the UK, France is in Belgium. But generally, across the European Union, you do have this trend of young Muslim Europeans being very emphatic about the idea that they want to relate to Europe as Europeans while still remaining faithful to their own identity as religious believers, as Muslims. And again, this is something that we have to come back to. I mean, Luke was talking about, you know, European Union policies on integration and so on. Um, I remember in 2003, which isn't that long ago, um, talking to people at the European Commission about the need to have uh, rules and regulations protecting people from religious discrimination. They said, you know, we, d we really don't think that's a problem. We, we don't think religious discrimination is a problem. Now, it wasn't so much that they thought, oh, religious discrimination is a good idea. They just really thought that it wasn't happening. They had huge numbers of things on ethnic discrimination, national discrimination, and so on, but not so much on religious. That, that obviously has changed, and this, this shows you how uh, we in Europe are thinking about these issues in a different sort of way. Going back to the, uh, to the Muslim community angle of it, though, um, on top of engaging in these new cultural ex exercises where they're being very proud of their national identities as French and Germans and so on, they're also uh, indulging in a bit of historical research because the, the history of Islam and Muslims in the European Union it goes back a very long way. Now, obviously, in big numbers within the European Union, Muslims have been you know, virtually insignificant up until the last uh, 40 years. But that's not to say that there isn't a long history of engagement between the Muslim world and Islam as a religion, as, as a civilization within Europe. And that's something that you see these different communities getting more involved with, writing books, doing programs, engaging in new media. It's a very different type of discourse that you see 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. So very, very different in the past 10 years, where they're, they're taking as given that this isn't simply the country that we've been born in after our parents came from somewhere else. This is the country where our grandchildren are going to die. This is the place where we have to create a new way of being, not as foreigners, not as uh, aliens, but as real integral elements of society and i think there are a lot of uh, a, lo a lot of uh, there's a lot of ground that they can draw on in that regard there's a lot of material that they can look at because if if you do look at history uh, you can find that all across europe and i mentioned the tatars in lithuania and poland but you can talk about other things as well 
um, especially if you look outside the European Union, but within Europe going further into Southern Europe. I believe one of the speakers here today is from Kosovo. And uh, Kosovo's in Europe, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, Albania, um, the, the Ottoman legacy all across Europe. The, these, these are very real pertinent things that are sometimes difficult for Europeans to think about because we also have a history of conflict with the Muslim world, okay? Uh, prior to colonialism, um, going back many centuries. So th it is a rather complex kind of relationship that has evolved um, and it does affect how we now consider identities because it, it's all well and good to talk about coexistence when you're talking about somebody who's outside. But the, as Rashad put it earlier, the otherization that takes place if American Muslims feel it in America, uh, I guarantee you that all of the uh, European Muslim communities that I've researched in the past 10 years, um, they, they're sure of it. it. It's something that impacts their lives on a daily basis. And yet, in spite of all of that, and this is where I think really my, my note of optimism comes from, in spite of all of that, they're very, very keen to ensure that it doesn't stop them from continuing on this process of creating these new identities as legitimate, integral parts of their societies. I'm sure we'll get into more of that later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open th uh, the panelists up to the floor. So questions, please. Gentlemen over there. Nazia said integration is two ways. It's not only one way. It's so uh, there must be a European contribution and also a Muslim contribution. So my first question to relate to, relate to this, uh, and this is to all the three panelists, and I have one question for you, Hisham. Yeah? Uh, uh, what is uh, the contribution of Muslim immigrants to this? I mean, we ex expect, we migrants, we ex ex expect from Europe recognition and uh, granting us uh, uh, the right of equality and above all sense of belonging. Yeah, I lived in Germany for 40 years and I failed to get s sense of belonging. Yeah, but uh, I think it is wrong to just to point at the Europeans. Also, one has to point at the Muslims. What what are the Muslims are not doing? Yeah, so we know what the Europeans are not doing. Yeah, so this question to all of you and question for Hisham. Uh, uh, I think we have very something uh, uh, much in common, you know, uh, not only as Muslims living in Europe, but as a scholars, yeah? Uh, so religion as an identity, becoming identity of 23 million Muslims living in Western Europe and 12 million Muslims living in the Balkan. Um, and uh, now my question to you is this. Uh, in my research on this subject, uh, uh, not only as a scholar, but somebody who is experiencing the problem on the ground, is the ethnicization of Islam in Europe. And so religion, uh, I'm a Muslim, and Islam is not an ethnicity. But on the grounds, uh, the ident identification with Islam as identity become ethnic. Yeah? And this is an ethnicization of the Islam diaspora. And there's another process of ethnicization among the Europeans. You, to be European is not ethnic, but there are two ethnicities emerging in Europe in the past years uh, with conflict uh, and enforcing one another. And it took me three years uh, uh, to publish an article at, uh, about this in the Journal of Ethnicity and uh, Nationalism at the LSA in London because this is a hot bottom issue. It took three years to publish the article that was published last year, uh, last week, I'm sorry, last week, and the, the title Ethnicity of Fear. I am fearful of this. Yeah? How do you evaluate this ethnicization of identity based on religion? And it contributes to separation. It does not co contribute to uh, integration. And there is another ethnicization process among the Europeans. How do you evaluate this? Yeah, you touched on it, but you did not evaluate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I would like to ask um, the, the first question that was asked, what is the contribution of Muslims to its uh, own integration, beginning with uh, um, Luke, um, then to file, and then Hisham, if you could take the other question sure. as well. Can I just ask? Um, people asking questions, just if you could just really focus on what you want to ask um, in terms of just making it very brief so we can get a lot of questions in as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is a, very, a very interesting question indeed. And I would like to briefly come back to one remark made by m the previous speaker with regard to his 
is, uh, you know, observation in 2003 that uh, European Commission, at least the people he was talking to in the European Commission, were not at all concerned with our religious discrimination. And then he said in a sentence, this may have changed. Um, I, 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 I restricted myself to the five or seven minutes, and I did not um, develop one of the key institutions that, uh, or I didn't say anything uh, of substance really on the key institution that I briefly mentioned, the European um, Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. And one of the major contributions of that particular agency is to conduct um, research on treatment of minorities and, and discrimination. And I, I think it has been a very useful tool to help collect data and provide EU policymakers uh, with evidence-based um, advice on, on fundamental rights. In 2009, this particular agency carried out the largest EU-wide uh, survey of a randomly selected representative sample of 23,500 migrants and minorities to explore are they experience um, discrimination and, and criminal uh, victimization, uh, two key barriers to integration. And the EU in turn um, has benefited from the um, research conducted over the years by this, this particular agency. I wanted to not leave you with the impression that uh, discrimination issues, in particular religious discrimination, because this particular agency has um, brought in particular uh, greater awareness of the phenomena of Islamophobia and this is something that I, I wanted to say. But with regard to, um, I, will answer, I, will answer, I, I will answer to your question from this perspective of, of religious discrimination. Because it's a complex issue that it cannot be um, measured in isolation. And there, is, uh, there are these uh, basic principles that I mentioned in terms of our immigration policy. And I will read out from, two, uh, from 2004, and I will read out one of these principles um, because this constitutes the framework for the entire European Union of our integration policy. And I will read out directly from this principle, and this is an answer to, to, to your question, I think indirectly, and my colleagues will, will of course give you um, other perspective. It says, and I quote, Member states, so this is the European Union talking to the member states, which is, which is the natural way for us, have a responsibility to ensure that cultural and religious practices do not prevent individual migrants from exercising other fundamental rights or from participating in the whole society. This is particularly important, I continue to quote, as it pertains to the rights and equality of women. So one should not, um, all formal discriminations have to be taken on their own merits. And I think it's particularly important, as I recall, that the European Union do recognize that religious discrimination is a very important issue. At the same time, there is the basic principle that I recall, which is part of our integration policy of the two-way street of the integration policy, which is a response to your concern, I guess, of what migrant communities have to do in order for the integration to work. Thank you. Um, thanks. I was, I'll answer it in uh, two different ways. I think the question that you raised is very important about how, what role um, or contribution have Muslims made as part of that integration process. Um, and one is recognizing their current role and recognizing that actually that comes through 
straightforward and basic participation in the local communities in which they live, whether it's an employment, um, political participation. So some of the you know, social welfare institutions, such as the National Health Service in Britain, wouldn't be able to function without migrant labor, people who came as migrant laborers working in there. So recognizing that economic growth that Europe has benefited from since the, in the post-war period was a significant contribution to that came from those migrant laborers and that migration wasn't just a favor that was being granted to people that you know Europe at that point needed migrants in order to rebuild its economy rebuild its society and that this was the contribution that was made and then the second point that I'd made because it came it came out of a very interesting conversation that I had with a youth worker in a local city in um, in England and he works with young Muslim kids who are kind of um, very marginalized and they often face this question from um, people who are abusing them saying you know go back to your own country what have you ever done what have your people ever done for this country and he tells them this he says to them he's, a, he's also a community historian he says to them tell them about the second world war tell them about the first world war tell them that the largest volunteer army that fought for Britain was from the subcontinent and huge numbers of those 400,000 Muslim soldiers died defending this country and then ask them would they do the same for you for their for your country and similar issues arose in France during the, there's a recent film Days of Glory which looked at the contribution and the role of North African and black African soldiers in defending France. So I think you're right, that those, those histories of contribution need to be um, told in order for people to recognize that actually it's not just a, in the last few decades that Muslims have participated, that there's a longer um, a historical participation. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the role of uh, Muslim soldiers during the First and Second World Wars are quite you know, important histories to be, to be retold as reimagining that the identity of Europe and the participation of Muslims in Europe. If I could just briefly come back to, to Luke's point, because I also don't want to give an incorrect impression. Um, the, the point about religious discrimination isn't that Europe uh, and the European Union and different institutions relating to the European Union have not taken this on board. I'm saying this is something new. I'm saying this is something that um, has developed over recent years. Um, and we, we have new regulations and new uh, reg uh, laws and rules that pertain now to religious discrimination, and we're still working out how they be applied. Um, and we still have some loopholes and some uh, uh, quirks in the mix, um, hence why you find the European Court of Human Rights, for example, accepting that a headscarf ban is legal. So uh, these are things that we're still discussing and that we're still coming to. Um, and we need to see how they can be properly put into practice. Um, on the question from uh, uh, Bassam Tibi, um, religion as an identity marker, as an ethnic marker, or uh, this term ethnicization, uh, which I like, um, the transformation, the reduction of the category of Muslim mm, from a faith-based idea to an ethnic identity or a political expression. Um, it seems a lot in Europe have actually fallen into this trap. I think actually more so outside of the Muslim community than inside of it. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not going to say if that's good or bad because I think that that's just natural considering how we're discussing identity and how we're discussing uh, religion in the 21st century in Europe. Um, but it's very interesting that you, you now see commentators talking about things like the Hajj, for example, as um, the annual assembly of Muslims. Um, which is rather bizarre because um, Islamic studies experts will tell everybody in this room that Muslims would go on the Hajj if there wasn't another Muslim alive in the world. You know, the, the presence of other Muslims is really quite incidental. Um, they don't go to hobnob. Um, and another, uh, another thing uh, which brings us back to, you know, issues about religious discrimination in Europe, the, the hijab, um, which is a religious mandated practice. It's not an expression of a political identity. Some people might take it like that, um, but that's not essentially what it is. It could be a positive expression, it could be a negative one, but that's not where it comes from. Um, and this for me is actually part of the whole process of, uh, process of ethnicizing religion um, and seeing how uh, you know, concepts that relate to religion um, in the pre-modern era are now transformed. So the ummah, for example, the idea of the, the worldwide community of Muslims becomes some sort of political um, marker, um, which is really quite interesting um, and something that uh, I think will become a topic of uh, scholars such as you and myself for many years to come. Um, whether we like it or not, though, this is, uh, this is quite natural. Um, 
it's not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's really down to what people make of it. Um, and you can see how different types of identities within Europe have previously been used quite positively to encourage people to get so engaged. Is it, is it an optical configuration? It's a synchronization? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it really, I think it depends on how people take it because you could have people taking a religious identity, okay, if we can use that expression, because as you pointed out, it's quite problematic. They could use it in a way that encourages members of that community to be more involved in society and consider themselves to be integrated in that society. That, this, can, this is possible, okay? We're just talking theory here. This is very possible, and I've seen it happen. You can also have it that if they construct it in a way that these types of identities are mutually exclusive, then obviously it's impossible, right? Because it, if you say that, this type of identity, which is type A, all right, and this type of identity, which is also type A, they are mutually exclusive, then obviously they're going to clash. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case for Muslim communities in Europe. I think that um, there is a bit of ethnicization going on, um, and I wonder if that's more or less problematic than what came before it, which was Pakistani, Turkish, Arab, so on and so forth. Um, it may just be replacing that, in which case, you know, since we're in America, hyphenated identities can work very well. Um, but it really comes down to where those communities are really motivated to express to themselves as well as to the outside that this is their home. This is where they truly belong. And whatever identity they choose to use uh, to identify themselves, I, I think that that's the most important thing to look for. Thank you very much. Gentleman over there. Hi, um, my name is Mario Fimiovlos. I'm a policy scholar with the Southeast Project um, here at the Wilson Center. Now, I, I wanted to, to ask you about something, and I want to challenge you a bit, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hollier, uh, perhaps. Um, um, the, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky question. I, I'm, I'm Greek. Um, so um, Greece is, has, has, has a different paradox when it comes down to a discussion about uh, Muslims, or if we go down to narrowing down the issue between Greece and Turkey, you mentioned, for example, the case of uh, of, of Turks being in Eastern Greece, uh, Eastern Northern Greece, and Thrace, right? Um, in terms of official foreign policy, uh, somebody would come up to you and say, "These are Greek Muslims. They are born in Greece. They have Greek identity. They're Greeks, but they're Muslims." Now, the fear that is going on for in the latest years, and something that Greece has been going on looking uh, at all the time, is the fact that Muslim, uh, Muslims as, you know, as, um, uh, as a religion has been tied up with the future of the foreign policy of Turkey, something that we lately have been seeing Turkey having different movements in the Middle East or taking initiatives. Uh, according to you know to a sort of speech that there needs to be to be there between the Muslims and the West. Now, last week there was a conference of the Middle Eastern Institute that something that um, they were talking basically about Turkey's uh, foreign foreign policy. And somebody came up and asked. He said, "Well, um, he said that I I don't understand why Turkey should explain itself about the Armenian genocide, for example, or any kind of." Uh, things that were going on during the Ottoman Empire, because Turkey has a uh, government by itself. And Excuse it me, sir. Thing. Can I just ask you just to ask your your, your yeah, question? I have to explain that in order to make myself understand. We're, we're going to um, break up in a short while, so sure, please I'm, I'm just get to the point. Thank sentence. you. So, what I what I what I what I would suggest, and sort of my my question would be, how can we actually not combine the religion religion with a nationality? Because we like, for example, to go to the Arab countries, but when it comes down to foreign policy of Greece, we don't like Turkey because it invades the Aegean, for example. Uh, and then we, we sort of blame the, the Muslims. But then again, when we say Muslims, we don't, uh, we don't think of Turkey. We think of the Arab countries or the Middle Eastern countries. So that's my Thank question. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we have time to take another two questions before we start answering them all together. Go ahead. <clears throat> Florian Dottier from the National Council on Yes Air Relation. Uh, Mr. Veron, you mentioned the EU member states' need for immigration to sustain their economic growth. Uh, at the same time, we see that there is temptation for EU governments to 
capitalize politically on their constituents' fear of immigration, especially in times of economic crisis and before elections. Uh, so my question is simple. Uh, what can the what, 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 what role can the, EU, the EU play to uh, change this mindset or to tackle the inability or unwillingness of, of the EU member state government to speak the truth about the need of migration and or to appease uh, the fears of EU citizens about immigration, be they, be they funded or unfunded? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. One more question? No more questions. Okay, um, Hisham, if you could take the first question and Luke the second. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of the, the questioner. Mario. 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 Yasuo Mario. Um, first, um, just, an, uh, just a sidebar, the, the idea of not combining religion and nationality. Um, I think you know in Greece that's something that's virtually impossible um, in terms of just defining what it means to be Greek. You, you have to relate to the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, so it's, uh, this is, uh, don't worry, this isn't in response to your question because I understand you're talking about something a little bit different, but the idea that we can now talk about nationality and religion in these sort of separate kind of categories is, it can be very, very difficult um, for just reasons of history. I mean, you talked about the, uh, uh, the Turkish Muslims in Thrasi. Um, they, they may be Greek citizens, they may carry Greek identity cards and Greek passports and so on, um, but they definitely have an identity as Turks. It's very different. It's very different than what Turks in Turkey might feel. It's very different from what Turks in America might feel as well. But it's definitely an identity that they hold quite clearly too, um, similarly to Greek Americans, I suppose, in terms of their Greek identity. Um, on to your question. Um, I think it's very difficult for countries in Europe that have had a long historical relationship with the Muslim world to sever that when discussing these sorts of foreign policy issues. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine how Greece with such a long history within the Ottoman Empire, um, and even before that, with the, um, beyond that with the Muslim world and now as well, um, how they could actually separate you know, that sort of history from how foreign policy is dictated. Uh, I'm not saying that they're continuing, you know, the, uh, the policy of uh, 50 or 100 years ago, but it's very difficult, I think, for societies to make those sorts of breaks. Um, and it's something that happens on both sides. I, I'm sure the same, uh, exactly the same happens in Turkey, you know, um, and you see it most vividly um, with regards to this particular issue between Greece and Turkey and Cyprus. Right. I mean, this is it's a it's still a very, very hot topic. Um, so I'm not sure that there's there's much hope <laughs> in that regard uh, in terms of differentiating these things. Um, but I think people just need to be honest about them um, and come to some sort of agreement of how to read history, because on, on the one hand, uh, you do have a sort of national conscious memory within Greece of how life used to be under the Ottomans, um, which is very different from how Turkey and uh, Turks with, uh, within the European Union conceive of the Ottoman memory. Um, these are completely different narratives, completely different national narratives, um, completely different historical narratives. And until we can get to a point where we can have those sorts of discussions in a very sort of normal, relaxed kind of way, including about the Armenian genocide, um, I think that we're going to continue to have these sorts of problems with regards to present day foreign policy issues. Um, and you see it in the sort of rhetoric that takes place. You see it in the media. Um, my Greek is lousy. Um, I, I know everybody was impressed by the one word I spoke at the beginning. Um, but you see it in the Greek press. You see it in the Turkish press. You see it um, in the popular press as well as the mainstream press. This sort of rhetoric really plays on these historical memories. And, and that's something very important for us to keep in mind. Thank you. Luke? Yes. Sorry. Uh, yes. Um, what can we do uh, in order to demonstrate the role of that uh, migrants play in the EU economy or to change the conversation in Europe? I actually, when I mentioned this, I was quoting from a European commissioner. And I do believe this is quite symptomatic of the kind of role that uh, the different institutions in Europe, in the EU, can play um, 
in this conversation, and I, I think this is this is important. I, I was I was very impressed by what Tufshan said before me, uh, with the he was he, he was uh, in a sense modest when he said there are cultural uh, issues uh, like um, demonstrating the role of migrants over over time over history in fighting wars, in contributing to, to, to the economy. And this is something that, uh, frankly, the European Commission has been doing all along. And I think that contributes to change the conversation um, from, a, from a policy maker's standpoint. I mean, they, but is there, is there a directive that, uh, that uh, the European Union, is there, is there a law that the European Union can could promote that would change a political conversation, I think that that would be a bit too much to ask for. But certainly playing an active role in, in, in making the data available and also um, influencing the political discourse, I don't think the European Commission, the European Parliament are, are shy to do that. I would like to say two things, one about Greece. Um, this is as a result of, if I'm not mistaken, of Greek membership in the European Union. That religion is no longer mentioned on uh, the identity cards of uh, Greek citizens, number one, a small remark. Number two, um, with regard to um, anti-discrimination, um, the directive on anti-discrimination uh, prohibiting particularly um, discrimination in employment based on religion dates back from 2000. So it's over 20 years. And I can even quote its uh, directive 2000 slash 78 slash EC. So I just want to make that remark in, in, with regard to the uh, the fact that, and the debate and the, the interesting interaction that I had with my, my colleague here about uh, the EU waking up to the notion of religious discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that is now the end of our uh, panel discussion. Our Two of our speakers will be available during the coffee break if there's any other questions. Um, and Luke, I think, is about to, to leave. But um, I think I'd, li I'd like to just summarize um, the, the discussion um, by um, pointing out that what you've heard today is um, three different uh, perspectives which uh, come together or link together in terms of what are the, the, the situations and the experiences and what are the sort of, what is a political kind of context in which um, communities, minority communities um, operate now um, in Europe. And I think it's been very interesting to get the, the very local level, but also to hear from the, the, the EU in terms of what is being planned and what is actually being understood undertaken and then from Hisham in terms of what role religion um, and identity is is playing in Europe today and I think for us in terms of our work at the uh, at the OSI that is uh, becoming more and more challenging and more and more important um, in regards to how you then affect that on the everyday kind of level so I'd like to thank you all very very much um, for your participation and the panelists as well and the Woodrow Wilson School of Scholars and I think it's coffee break time now, so thank you. Thank you.